Well, welcome back to Smart Life. I'm Dr. Tina. The, Evo- the Ebola virus uh, is here, and um, my opinion is it's probably going to be something that we're going to be talking about in the days, months, and years to come. So now what do we do? Dr. Richard Amerling from the Mount Sinai Beth Israel in New York City joins us now, and uh, the, I hope that he's going to tell us not to worry, Dr. Amerling. Welcome back to the show. Um, last time I saw you, not last time I saw you, last time I saw you besides here, was the Hannity Doctors Panel. At that time, we were talking about what had happened exactly a year ago that was the rollout of uh, the website uh, for Obamacare, and we were talking about what a tragedy it would be, how expensive it would be, and how much trouble it would be. But none of us could have predicted, perhaps you could have, but it wasn't in the news, at least at this time, that we were going to be seeing diseases like Ebola here in the United States. And the first question I want to ask you, just right off the top of the bat, does this have anything to do with illegal immigration? And if it did, Dr. Ammerling, do you think there's a chance in the world we'd actually know about it? Well, this current case, uh, from what I've read anyway, is a patient that flew into the country from uh, West Africa. Uh, Whether he's legal or illegal, I do not know. Uh, Of course, there is the potential for people coming across the border uh, from Mexico who could potentially carry this disease. I have no idea what kind of screening is going on, if any, of illegal immigrants currently uh, pouring through the border. I certainly hope that people are being checked for at least current infections, at least signs of current infections, and anybody who is at all sick should not be allowed into the country. There's no question about it. Well, we know that many of the children that were brought in over the summer, because it happened right here in my hometown, uh, we know that um, many, many of them were sick indeed, and we don't know exactly what was wrong with them, but we know that some of these diseases have a long latency period, example tuberculosis and some of the other uh, t- more subtropical diseases that we haven't seen in the United States in a long, long time or ever. Um, and, and so we may not know for 20 years is my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong. Tell us about the manifestation and the latency period of Ebola. Well, Ebola is something that you won't miss. Uh, The incubation period for Ebola is between 2 and 21 days. Uh, Average is about 8 to 10 days. So if someone is infected and is going to develop it, they will develop symptoms within that time frame. So I'm pretty confident that we're not going to miss that many cases of Ebola. Although I must say that the initial presentation is nonspecific. It's like a viral syndrome with uh, fever, malaise, uh, body aches, and the like. And uh, I do know that the patient who was just diagnosed in Dallas was initially turned away from the emergency room when he first presented. And then he came back in very sick. So that is something that people must pay attention to. And back in the old days, we always used to learn that when someone comes in with any infectious disease, you have to ask them about travel history. And it's all the more important now to ask that crucial question. I think that if somebody had asked that question, that uh, the proper diagnosis would have been made, or at least the suspicion of that diagnosis would have been made, and this guy would not have been sent back out into the community. Well, ironically, like uh, just a week before this, apparently they'd been trained exactly what to do with Ebola, and yet they weren't asking those kinds of questions. That's sort of sort of uh, very disturbing. Dr. Emily, tell us for our own knowledge. Just tell us about the, the symptoms as they, as they onset, so what, what we would look for in, in people and be concerned about, especially on an sure. airliner. Sure. Well, uh, let, let me just give you a couple of uh, well, some good news, which is that until patients are symptomatic, they are not infectious. So you cannot get, at least according to current knowledge, you cannot become infected with someone who is still in the incubation period, which is extremely fortunate because it would be impossible to pick up people in the, in the pre-infectious period uh, with, without uh, very sophisticated testing that is not readily available. So clinically, as I said, uh, usually 8 to 11 days after exposure, and exposure is either by ingestion or transmission of body fluids, such as uh, uh, vomitus, uh, blood, obviously, semen potentially can can transmit this, Uh, sweat even can, Uh, you would develop the abrupt onset of fever, 
chills and malaise, including body aches. Uh, you'll lose your appetite, may get headaches and pain. Now, obviously, these are all nonspecific symptoms. So if anyone in your audience is feeling a little off, if they haven't been exposed to someone who's been in West Africa recently, they do not have to worry. They're, they do not have Ebola. So I really don't want people to go out there and panic if they have a couple of uh, these symptoms. Uh, you may get pains in the trunk and lower back. The heart rate uh, is typically relatively slow relative to the, infect to the fever. There may be a non-productive cough or a sore throat. A rash is often present on the face, neck, trunk, and arms. And you may get watery diarrhea, GI symptoms. Nausea, vomiting, and watery diarrhea are, are typical, or and abdominal pain. So these are the typical presenting symptoms for Ebola. Okay, okay, but I'm reading a lot about uh, an airborne possibility. You're not buying that? Uh, no, from what I've read, and I've read an extremely recent update. Now, by the way, as, a, as just a full disclosure, I'm a nephrologist, okay? I'm not an infectious disease but I am a physician and I can read stuff and look up and become current, uh, you know, very quickly. I've never seen a case of Ebola. I hope I never do. But uh, these things are uh, regularly updated and at least from my information, um, there is a possibility of airborne transmission with a very heavy exposure to an aerosol let's say during a medical procedure. So let's say somebody is getting a bronchoscopy or some sort of invasive procedure where uh, large quantities of aerosolized uh, Ebola virus could potentially be blown into somebody's face. Uh, that's the sort of exposure you would need to get an aerosol exposure. Uh, there was, uh, you know, of course, talk years ago, I remember reading the Tom Clancy book when he, he uh, had Iran as a uh, as weaponizing Ebola and then starting an epidemic in the United States. And the way that they weaponized it was to make it uh, aerosolized. So as far as I know, that doesn't exist. That was fiction. But uh, so, so as I said, airborne transmission would be extremely unlikely unless you were heavily exposed during a medical procedure. Okay, then explain to me how all of these people in West Africa have died. It seems to have happened so quickly. And it seems like you know, it seems like it would be so much easier to contain if the only transmission was possible through a pretty significant amount of exchange of, of bodily fluid, just to be very crass about it. So, so how did this massive epidemic break out? Well, there are two things that have been uh, identified. One is the ritual washing of uh, dead people before they're, before they're buried. And that is uh, probably how many people were exposed to Ebola in West Africa. And the other area is uh, the healthcare workers. The healthcare workers have had an incredible rate of exposure and infection. And this relates to very poor in barrier control techniques uh, that we uh, take, kind of take for granted here. They obviously don't have them in place. And that has been a major source of uh, the infection. Hundreds of healthcare workers have been infected and many have died. All right. Well, thank you so much for your insight, Dr. Ammerling. You can follow him at Dr. Ammerling on Twitter.